Tate Chronicles now transmitting. Welcome to the Tate Chronicles on Healthcare Now Radio. And now, here's your host, Jim Tate. Good day, citizens of the free world, from border to border, coast to coast, and to all the ships at sea, I bring you a warm welcome. This is your correspondent, Jim Tate, and thank you for joining me today on this, which is the third in a series of special episodes looking at policies impacting connected health technologies and healthcare. Throughout this series, joining me has been my co-host, Morgan Reed, president of the App Association. Morgan is also heavily involved with the Connected Health Initiative, or CHI, which is a coalition of industry stakeholders and partners working to clarify outdated health regulations. Morgan, good to be back together with you. Jim, it's always a pleasure. And, um, you know, I know this is our third time, but I got to say, it's uh, always refreshing. Um, and I, I love the both the ideas, the energy, and the focus that you're doing on your podcast. And I know your listeners are uh, are really well rewarded by the depth of insight that you're able to bring to this game. Well, it's, Morgan, uh, very me, useful. Uh, let me say that I'm also well re- rewarded because as I prepare to have these discussions with you, I have to do a little background research, and I find out things I didn't know. <laughs> and today is is one of those things, and because our topic today is one that folks in healthcare should probably know about, but probably don't. It is the Open App Markets Act, which is currently winding its way through Congress. There's quite a lot to unpack, so let's begin at the beginning. What is this Open App Markets Act, and how does that affect healthcare? Yeah, no, Jim, it's a great question. And there's there's actually two bills out there, but both of them essentially operate in the same realm. And, and that is bills aimed at kind of tech and antitrust. But the real question for this audience and why they care has to go back to something that we all deal with every day in the healthcare space. And that is protecting the privacy and security of our patients and the realities of trying to make sure that we're complying with HIPAA. Now, Jim and I, Jim, you and I know that the number of times that HIPAA is misquoted, right? You know, if you go on Twitter and you see HIPAA, first of all, people got, you know, people use too many P's. And second yeah. of all, the number of folks who talk about HIPAA in the wrong way is, is, is it's painful. For those of us who work in healthcare, I always see HIPAA brought up and I just flinch because I know it's going to be bad. But it really gets to a core issue that we all deal with constantly, and that is, We have a requirement by law and a duty from a moral sense to make sure that the privacy of our patients are protected, that this most sensitive data is protected. On the flip side, we've also got laws under 21st Century Cures and Cures 2.0 and the Office of National Coordinator that says a patient must, must have access to their electronic health records and you must make available to them using APIs and other technologies and you can't charge them much money for it and it's got to be essentially seamless so that a patient can move their data from place to place because it's their data. So we have these two mandates of give people their data but also make sure that you protect it zealously and if you don't the Office of Civil Rights is going to come after you with an enforcement action. So in healthcare, we're living with this world. And the reason that this matters is um, something that most people don't know, um, certainly outside of healthcare, is there is no federal comprehensive privacy legislation or law in America. Europe has GDPR, other countries have their own, but America doesn't actually have a umbrella privacy law. Some of it's Some of it falls under HIPAA, as we all know, Mm -hmm. but most of it falls under the Federal Trade Commission. And some of it either also falls even under other agencies, depending on what kind of data it is or what situation it is. But we actually don't have a comprehensive privacy law. So the reason this matters is a big fight and a big tension in the Open App Markets Act is really between tech giants like Facebook, who are interested in data, mm-hmm. and Apple, which um, wants no, you know, wants to keep the data and not ever see it because they sell hardware, and Facebook, who sells ads, and Google, who does a little bit of both. So you've got all these big tech companies, and they're all vying for data. And the problem is the bills essentially all um, operate around this one fundamental concept that 
they want to have a law that essentially says that all devices, that all phones, that all portable things essentially should be open to any app or any software that you download that you can install it and um, and you can run it on anything you want and that nobody can tell you not to. Now, on some level, the freedom loving part of us all says, well, that sounds really good. But that also means it means your patients or hospital staff can willy nilly install apps on their iPhone or their phone that they've got and essentially put you in your hospital at enormous risk for a data breach. So how do you how do you balance this? Right. Because on somewhere some way in some places in healthcare, barriers are actually useful barriers that make it harder for your staff who saw a funny YouTube clip and clicked a link and said, oh, this looks fun. I'll play this game. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's not a game. It's actually a stub for malware that basically hoovers up all the data. You've got a problem. So the, the nuts and bolts of it is this. We don't have a privacy bill. These bills are coming along and saying all of these tech platforms need to be opened up with no restrictions, no barriers. The the app store that Apple has must allow other uh, whatever app wants in. They should not be able to gatekeep that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, same with Google Play, all that. So it's it's open everything up, but it's running into this lack of a privacy law and this lack of the ability to basically help healthcare make sure that they're protecting this thing that they've got another law over their heads that says if you don't do this right we're coming in and we're gonna we're gonna sure. take all your money sure sorry that was a long-winded way well, but essentially yeah well, we've got the, the that's the basic pillar of the open app markets act it's right well, there in the name they well, want to open up the apps and to the, everything and everyone and and so um why now morgan uh is this something that's been talked about for a number of years and it's finally made its way into uh, potential legislation. What's, what's well, behind? Jim, yeah. if I can be candid with your audience, yep. it's because almost everybody in America is kind of peeved off. There's another word we'd use that starts with a P at tech, right? Tech's Absolutely. too rich, tech's too big. Yeah. If you're from the left, tech isn't doing enough. If you're from the right, tech is doing too much. Everybody in America seems to be just tired of tech's attitude. <laughs> and so the, the bills are coming along and, and kind of reflecting a feeling rather than a result. And the hard part for those of us who work in the healthcare space is that we, we have to be results oriented, whether it's uh, focusing on how do we show that we're using CPT codes right if we're filing with CMS to get reimbursement or we need to meet the test for FDA under efficacy. We're very results oriented rather than feelings oriented. And both of the major pieces of legislation are as much about expressing a feeling as anything else. And that's at the core of why these bills have kind of come up out of nowhere. And um, I certainly don't want to discount people feeling that way. Sure. I just, uh, it's really hard when you're sitting there on the edge on healthcare and saying, hey, but how about not doing this before we have some privacy rules in there? Because this will just kind of rip the rip the, the roof off the house without um, rebuilding the infrastructure we need. You know, there are a lot of philosophical questions behind this, Morgan. Um, if you ask uh, John Q. Public on the street, do they care about privacy? They say, oh, yes, I care about privacy. But when they're online, the behavior is such that they don't care about privacy at all. Um, so, Jim, this yeah. this is a great point. We, we debate this all the time. Mm -hmm. Behavior versus intent. There's one wrinkle I'd throw in this, and yep. that is there's some great research by uh, um, a professor at Carnegie Mellon named um, Lori Craner. Uh, she was the um, Federal Trade Commission's chief technology officer, a brilliant woman. And she looks at something that basically says what we're the, the miss here is that people don't actually understand what they've agreed to when they agree to something. So when you say their behavior says they don't care about privacy, what her research shows is that you do care about it in ways that make sense, meaning mm -hmm. you don't hand out your credit card number to everybody. You, you're you careful with things that you understand yes. could negatively impact you. Are you posting pictures of your kids? Absolutely. Are you putting stuff on Facebook about that trip you took? Absolutely. But from your perspective, it's pretty hard to connect putting all that information on Facebook with, say, not getting a bank loan 
or um, not getting a job Mm -hmm. Uh, and not about political comments, meaning that you look like you're a credit risk. So I think what she really talks about is what you consent to, what you think you're consenting to doesn't match up with the way that your data, once it's in people's hands, can be used in a way that is unexpected to you. And there's another part of this that's even bigger that gets us back to healthcare. For criminals, the most valuable information to steal is your healthcare data. If you are gonna commit fraud and you are a crook, it's that old line of why do people rob banks? That's because of where the money is. Healthcare data, the reason that people are so interested in it, it's incredibly valuable for Medicare, Medicare fraud, for Medicare, Medicaid fraud, for device, you know, for purchasing um, from insurance fraud, you name it. Healthcare data, I've seen some estimates that say robust healthcare data can be worth as much as $7 a person. Um, And I know that that doesn't sound like much. That's a lot. If I were to go on the black market and buy, you know, your other data, it's, you know, fractions of a cent per person because it's so hard to monetize. Healthcare data, buying a big stack of people's secret healthcare information is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. And you'll pay up to like seven bucks a patient, uh, seven bucks a person for a big tranche of healthcare data on the black market. Give me maybe some more examples about um, how if this legislation passes without additional privacy concerns being addressed, it could affect healthcare. What are some of the scenarios? Well, one of the ones that I, I am the most worried about at this moment in time is what I talked about at the very beginning of my rant. And I guess I can call it a rant. It's that we are right now, um, our our hospital staff, our our staff at our clinics, the, the all of them, they're all walking around with incredibly powerful supercomputers in their pocket. And right now, a lot of systems even use what's called bring your own device, right? So that the Mm-hmm. That the your staff is actually using the phone that they bought with their own money to connect to and have access to certain portions of information inside of the hospital or inside of the clinic. A lot of that depends on the privacy and security systems that are built into the products themselves, whether it's the Google Play Store, the Apple Play Store, the, the Apple hardware, the Samsung phone. There's a level of depend, there's a lot of security that we depend on that comes right from the beginning. Um, Basic things. It's hard on an Apple device in particular to secretly track somebody. A little easier on Android, unfortunately, but on Apple, it makes it pretty hard to secretly uh, track someone. There are ways to do it, but you got to really work at it. Um, On Apple, it's very hard to install an application, what we call an app that has access to all of the features and all of the data because Apple requires um, an app to go through their their uh, um, app store yes. and they do some review of it. If the bill passes, Apple is no longer allowed to curate applications that somebody wants to install on their phone. It It says that you not only can have alternative app stores, but it allows something called sideloading, meaning that if I just... I'm on the web and I see something cool and I want to turn it into an app that Apple has to allow that to happen. But that's not the the kicker. It also says that Apple has to allow it to have the same level of access to the hardware that all of Apple's internal apps do, meaning it can't say, well, I don't really trust you. So I'll let you in the front yard, but I'm not letting you in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. The bill says they got to let them in the kitchen. They got to let them in the basement. They got to let them at the fuse box. And that worries me, given that we depend on our clinical staff to be engaged and informed and active and checking their phones and making sure they're on rotations and possibly pulling up data and being connected to this incredibly sensitive hospital system. And on the patient side, same thing. All of a sudden, somebody thinks they're downloading the application that's for remote patient monitoring but it turns out it's actually there to to link up and steal all the data. And um, this isn't like scary hand-waving. About a month ago, an application on the Google Play Store got in, and this is kind of the difference between Google Play and Apple, Mm -hmm. um, that claimed to be antivirus software. 
um, not only was it not antivirus software, it was actually virus <laughs> software. And um, about 10,000 people had their information and identity stolen because they downloaded what they thought was free antivirus software. Um, but the only thing it was was uh, anti your private information being kept private. So those are the kinds of elements that I think really put us at risk. And then kind of the other shoe that drops on that is if patients don't trust the systems and don't trust the device and we can't allow our staff to bring their own device and connect up, then all of a sudden we go back to, I'm not saying we'd ever go back to paper, but we move away from where we're headed, which is a much more fan, uh, much more faster transacting system that allows care teams to respond more quickly and more importantly, for remote for remote patient monitoring, I think it puts us back a long way if we can't do remote patient monitoring, especially around diabetes, hypertension, and some of those places where it's really hard to monitor somebody when they come in once every six months. So that's where I really get worried about sure. if we lose that trust framework. You know, you have um, outlined really succinctly, Morgan, um, the potential risk there. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's like, uh, th there's different sides of this and, um, and, and you can see the, uh, side and the argument for let's open everything up and you can see the other side, which is no, we don't want to open everything up, uh, but until privacy is dealt with. Um, and, uh, you have some of the big tech companies, they don't want to open up things probably because, uh, keeping them closed is to their advantage from a monetary standpoint, not necessarily yeah, from a privacy money. point at all. So we've got strange bedfellows here. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, you're totally right. I mean, a classic example is, look, do I think of Apple as a highly successful, completely capitalist company um, uh, bent on producing products that uh, that people both want, but also make, uh, make make sure that the company stays as one of the richest companies in the history of mankind? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. However, I also know that they make part of their money by doing a good job on privacy and security. They yeah. sell it, right? right? Facebook, on the other hand, is also a super rich company that I also think is a voracious capitalist looking to maximize their profit value. They make money off of selling ads based on your information. So for, for a Facebook who kind of supports some of these bills, for them, more open means more data, fewer, fewer restrictions means more ads, more advertising means more money. So in both of these cases, I'm not looking for either company to be altruistic. I'm depending on Apple to want to make money by protecting privacy and security because it makes the money. I expect Facebook to want access to your information because it makes them money. So I think you're 100% right, Jim. We should not take the capitalist reality out of this. But I pulling it back to our industry, to healthcare, yes. mm -hmm. I, want, I want that capitalist impulse to serve what we need. Now, it so happens for patients, I want privacy because of our restrictions under HIPAA and, the, and requirements for those of us who are covered entities and business associates. And I want security because without security, we won't get stuff approved by the FDA. We won't be able to do remote patient monitor. And frankly, we won't have the trust of our, of our patients, which we absolutely need. So in this case, I think the capitalist leanings of Apple mm -hmm. are more beneficial for healthcare because we have the shared interest of privacy and security. Now, healthcare needs them for different reasons than Apple does, but it probably makes more sense for us to benefit from those barriers that Apple or the the restrictions that Apple has in place. So you're completely right that the in the the reason these companies are doing it is not because of sunshine and sunshine and rainbows, but what is the product they're selling and how do people receive it? Do you think this um, most significant legislation, the Open App Markets Act, will be decided one way or another before the midterm elections in, in November? What do you think? Who me? You want, no. Jim wants me to get into the predictions business. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, well um, you know, I don't, whether they want to punt it down. You know, uh, one thing that um, 
has struck me as as these two bills. I guess there's one on the Senate side, one on the House side. Uh, uh, they pretty successfully go through subcommittees. Uh, so you've got that, uh, and and you've got um, uh, folks, you know, from 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 both political parties that, that can su- uh, seem to support it, but there are not many co-sponsors. And so um, I don't know if why that is, but it's just kind of fascinating um, how this is working out. It's it's so significant this legislation yeah. um, that. You know, it, it 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 kind of reminds me of the days of when there was all the uh, political negotiation and, and around the Affordable Care Act, but everybody knew about that. Hardly anybody knows about this, but it's a big. No, thing. you're you're exactly right. I think the I think the reality is, given the general population's feeling about the big tech companies, mm-hmm. when you're on that subcommittee. And, and this happened both in both situations on markups. Markup is when they, they vote on a bill and they go through it and mark it up, right, right there in the word, like making changes. A lot of members spoke up and said, this bill has a lot of flaws. Um, this has real problems with privacy and security. I'm concerned about privacy and security, but I'm still going to vote for it. Yes. And you'd say, well, wait a minute. You just spent 10 minutes telling us why you're really worried about this bill, but you also said you're going to vote for it. And it comes down to this. Do you want to be seen as voting for something that is for big tech or not? In other words, Mm -hmm. do you want to have to be a politician that's having to do a lot of explaining? Or do you want to say, I took a swing at big tech for the the little guy? And that's why you had a lot of folks on on the committee on both sides. Democrats, it was interesting to see a couple of, of, you know, clear... Democrats who came out and said that they were very concerned about the privacy and security elements. In fact, two days ago, uh, a huge letter, a uh, uh, open letter was released by um, the past bipartisan heads of uh, um, of the national security side of the world, including former Congresswoman Jane Harman um, from the Republicans. You had uh, Jay Johnson. You had the former head of Department of Homeland Security. They all came out and said that these bills were passed um, through committee, and that they were cons- they were risky because there had never been a national security bill on uh, a national security review of either bills. So it's exactly what you said. You've got former secretaries of state. I mean, former secretaries of security and intelligence. You had Leon Panetta, mm-hmm. definitely left of center. He came out and said the same thing. So you've got the you got the security folks coming out and saying, "Wait a minute, this just made it through this entire process." And nobody asked questions about it. So it was it was James Clapper from the De- director of national intelligence. I just pulled it up. Jane Harmon, who was the former head of the House Intelligence Committee. Jay Johnson, secretary of Homeland Security. Mike, Mike uh, Michael Morell, former acting director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Panetta, Sec Defense. Admiral Rogers, uh, former head of U.S. Cyber Command and the director of NSA. And Francis Townsend, the uh, um, assistant to, to the president for counterterrorism and homeland security, they all signed a letter, significantly bipartisan, saying what you just said, Jim. How the heck did this bill make it through all this when there are major yeah. national security level concerns? And I think it all gets back to the feelings part, mm-hmm. right? Basically, if you're on that committee, you're looking at yourself and saying, "Do I want to vote on a bill that I have to explain to people?" in a in in a 1000 word letter why i sucked up to big tech or right. do i just want to punt this football down the road and hope that somebody else says no yes or, ju- or just hope it never comes to the floor <laughs> exactly oh, hope it never comes and i, th- <laughs> exactly. I think exactly there's a lot around that morgan i know it, you're not going to believe it when i say it but we're almost totally out of time here let me try and sum it up in one sentence before we uh say, say our goodbyes for today um, this proposed legislation, if it passes without some privacy concerns being addressed, we're going to be at increased risk. Yeah, I think for healthcare, I think this bill is does not have the necessary and privacy and security protections built in. We need some barriers in healthcare, not barriers to innovation, but barriers to bad guys. Right? Sometimes the barrier is a wall that keeps the bad guys out. Mm-hmm. Um, we need those forms of barriers and these bills 
basically tear them all down and then say, well, we'll fix it later. I say, let's, let's fix it first, get comprehensive privacy legislation, give us the bridge between HIPAA and non-HIPAA covered data, right. do that first, and then let's revisit ways that we can make sure that big tech is performing um, the way that we as consumers need them to do. So until that time, uh, I think the order of events is out of events. You know, you don't, you don't, uh, you gotta, you gotta fix the patient. Um, you gotta triage the patient first and solve yes. the problem that you're faced with rather than, you know, going off to doing plastic surgery. So at this point in time, um, let's fix the core, the core thing that's missing, comprehensive privacy legislation. Then let's talk about the things that we need to, to uh, make sure that we have a vibrant economy and uh, fix it on that side of it. So that would be my perspective. Um, not saying no to the legis not saying no to legislation down the road. I just don't want to do it without the necessary privacy and security. Morgan, I'm going to take that straight to the bank. Uh, to our listeners, if they want more information about Morgan uh, Reed and the work of the Connected Health Initiative, they can go to connectedhi.com. That's connectedhi.com. To our audience, thanks for tuning in to this third episode of this series looking at policies impacting connected health technologies. A salute to you, Morgan, for coming on board as my co-host for this series. Jim, so glad to be here. And thank you so much to your audience for being great listeners and great thought leaders in this most important space. You can find more information on this show's program page at healthcarenowradio.com. Until we meet again, here's wishing you smooth sailing and safe harbors. Tate Chronicles transmission ending now.